the Americans start the aggression, he will be in complete isolation and he will fight alone with uh, but a few number of his supporters, a few, uh, a small number of his supporters. I would like here to draw your attention to, in this context, to a number of facts. In Um Qasr, there was no, there were no Republican guards. The division that fought the Americans and the British, and who is, uh, which is still fighting the Americans and the British, is not Republican guards. Is not a unit of the Republican guards. It is uh, the regular army of the divisions of the regular army, uh, Iraqi regular army. I also would like to draw your attention to the fact that the people who are fighting in Nasiriya or Souk al or in Samawa or Najaf and in the outskirts of Basra and Zubair, these are not from Tikrit. You know Iraq, these are not Tikrit, not from Tikrit. Uh, they also talked about Sunnah and Shia and the Sunni dominance on Iraq and how Shiites are against uh, the Sunni government. And we, as Iraqis, each person know that knows. All right, we're going to break away uh, from Tariq Aziz. Uh, this is videotape that was shot just a lot, little while ago in Baghdad, uh, Tariq Aziz, the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq, for the first time holding a news conference since uh, the start of this war. There had been some rumors, speculation out there that he may have been killed in that initial U.S. Uh, airstrike. Clearly, he is alive and well at this news conference, speaking out about very contemporary uh, issues, including Um Qasr, the battle for Um Qasr. We're going to go back to the White House, where Ari Fleischer, the press secretary, is still responding to reporters questions three times in the last two days why is he here so often um you say three times in the last two days i think he was here meeting with staff last week he met with staff this morning i'll meet with the president as i indicated he meets with staff it's just not my habit to read out every staff member's meeting with everybody in washington dc if i did that we'd never take any questions it all would be about what staffers met with whom um, so I can't speak to every staff meeting that somebody has. It's clearly an increased uh, presence here at the White House. How do you know that? If I haven't read out the staff meetings before, I don't think you have really much of a basis to compare whether he's here on an increased or the same level. As always, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, as part of his duties in this administration and in all administrations, meets with the most senior staff to discuss economic matters and meets with the president periodically. On that basis? On, on, that, on, on a periodic basis. basis. But a periodic, sure. the three times in two days? He's, there, he's, he's here that often? I don't know what you're making of that, but whatever the facts are, he meets with staff from time to time. Go ahead. Sorry, on GPS, you, you didn't answer the first yeah, I, I do not have any type of breakdown specifically on night vision versus GPS versus anti-tank guided missiles. We have concerns about all of them. Sorry, on Friday, the door still seemed to be a little bit open to exile. Over the weekend, there were some setbacks. The president had comments on it yesterday. There were apparent war crimes uh, executing American GIs in Iraq. Is the door now effectively closed to any arrangement for exile of Saddam and the leadership Well, you heard the president say yesterday he gave Saddam the 48 hours to leave the country to avoid military conflict, and he did not take him up on that. But I think if you look realistically now, uh, there, it's a hard thing to imagine that Saddam would now take advantage of it. Uh, we still are uh, hoping for every opportunity that result in uh, settling this as peacefully as possible. But I think you have to be realistic about what Saddam plans to do. Last week, Northwest Airlines uh, laid off several thousand employees blaming the war. Why hasn't the administration taken a position on an airline relief package? And would it oppose congressional efforts to add such a package to the war supplemental? Well, we, we continue to consult with the airlines. Meetings have been held here between administration economic uh, advisors and the airlines. The airlines, of course, even prior to September 11th, uh, we're not in a strong financial condition as they would have liked. September 11th made it harder and a large package was passed to help the airlines uh, with that. Of course, conditions now prior to the war also had an economic impact on the airlines, separate and apart from anything that's happened in Iraq. So we will continue to work with them and to listen to them, and I'm not going to prejudge all outcomes. Senator Lott, Senator McCain sent a letter last yeah. week, asked, which has not been answered yet. Uh, when is, is, it, is the administration going to take a position in time to consider it? 
as part of the war supplemental. As I mentioned, we'll continue to uh, work with Congress on this and listen to various advice we have. I can't predict all outcomes. April? Ari, uh, yesterday the President said someone asked him if he thought that the, the POWs would be coming back, and he said, of course. Well, the first, the first <coughs> response that we understand the White House or the military should be making is with the Red Cross to see how the POWs are. Has the White House gotten any information as to when the Red Cross will be going in to see them? That information would be uh, handled by the Department of Defense through our officials in the Gulf. That would not be the Red Cross conveying that to the White House. So again, I understand the sensitivity on this issue, but this still remains an operational matter involving our prisoners and our forces, and you'd have to address it to DOD. President Bush to make that statement, does he feel comfortable? Well, I think, April, you might want to take a look at the exact question he was asked. I think the question was, um, are there things that can be done to make sure they come home? And the president said, of course. Right. I don't think it was a guarantee. Right. But, but for him to make that, of course, that kind of leaves the impression, at least with me, that the Red Cross is involved, and once they get in, that's a sign. Once they get in and look, that is a, a, a clear signal that they could be coming home, if, they, if things could be working. Well, let's, let, us hope, let us hope that is the case. Ron? Anything new on the Turkish front, and what is the president doing to make sure Turkish troops stay out of northern Iraq? Position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Turkey is well known. We, we said it repeatedly. And um, we have American officials who are in contact with Turkish officials on a regular basis to make certain they understand our position, and uh, that continues. Have we got any assurances that they will stay out? Well, I think that uh, there are ongoing conversations about this. And our position is unchanged. It's been made very clear. And we continue to talk to Turkish officials about it. Um, there were many reports previously that Turkish forces had crossed the border, and none of those have materialized. But it does remain a matter of ongoing discussion and concern. Peter. You said that Presidents Bush and Putin discussed cooperation on humanitarian issues. But Correct. the Russians say that Putin urged the president to avoid, quote, a humanitarian catastrophe, unquote. Was this conversation perhaps a bit more contentious than uh, you've uh, indicated? No, uh, but, you know, I think it's fair to say that President Bush and President Putin have a good personal relationship, and it's also marked by being a good frank relationship. The two of them are comfortable saying directly to each other what they think, and that's the mark of a strong relationship. What I've noticed in diplomacy is oftentimes when people don't speak directly to each other about what they think, it's the mark of relations that are not as strong as they otherwise could be. So the two leaders do speak directly to each other. They speak frankly to each other. Um, they hold each other in high personal regard. Nevertheless, there are some differences in our views about situations in Iraq. I've walked you through several of them today. So what's your frank appraisal of uh, the Russians' concern about the U.S. provoking a humanitarian catastrophe? Well, I think the differences there are well known and obvious. Russia uh, did not think that military force should be used to disarm Saddam Hussein. Russia did not see the threat of Saddam Hussein the same way the United States in the post-911 world saw the threat from Saddam Hussein. So that's not surprising. But what is important is that especially when it comes to humanitarian issues, that we are able to work together. That remains important. Uh, all right, can you preview the Pentagon event tomorrow and on the supplement? All right, uh, we're going to break away from Ari Fleischer's briefing. Uh, Ari Fleischer, the White House press secretary, answering reporters' questions, uh, confirming that there was, in fact, a phone call between the President of the United States, the President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, earlier today. President Bush expressing deep concern over suggestions, reports, U.S. information that Russian companies have been providing some high-technology equipment even recently to the Iraqi government, including uh, jamming equipment that could jam GPS systems that would undermine the U.S. military effort, the United States, the Bush administration, insisting this is a violation of the U.N. sanctions that have been imposed against Iraq, and they're expecting the Russian government to, to deal with this, to stop providing the Iraqi government with this kind of sophisticated, high-technology equipment. The, the, uh, the press secretary also saying that the president is satisfied with the uh, rules of engagement that the U.S. military has, some murmurings out there from troops that they're, because they're, so pre they're trying to be so, so cautious in avoiding civi civilian casualties, as a result, some of the U.S. Marines and soldiers moving into southern and central Iraq are themselves becoming endangered. The president, through Ari Fleischer, satisfied with the military's rules of engagement that have been uh, put forward to prevent innocent civilians from being killed. We're going to continue to monitor Ari Fleischer's briefing. We also heard 
recently in the last few minutes from Tariq Aziz, the deputy prime minister of Iraq, uh, insisting that Saddam Hussein is alive and well in full control of the Iraqi government, and also insisting that uh, his prediction to the U.S. news media in advance of the uh, war that invading U.S. troops would be met by bullets, not flowers, is proving to be the case. And he's referring to the serious fighting going on at Umm Qasr, Nasiriya, Najaf, el elsewhere on the road to Baghdad. Uh, the, Iraq, the Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister insisting that uh, Republican Guard units aren't fighting in those places, but regular Iraqi soldiers. We're going to continue to show you live pictures of what's happening in Baghdad. Eyewitness accounts in the last hour or so say they've heard at least four thuds in the distance suggesting more bombing is underway right now. In the meantime, let's go to Judy Woodruff in Washington. She has more. Judy? Thanks, Wolf. And we did take note of what Tariq Aziz, the deputy prime minister, said, because this is the first time we've heard from him since the fighting got underway. Well, as we look at these live pictures of Baghdad, let's take an opportunity now to, to, uh, to answer the question, where do U.S. forces stand as they move toward uh, Iraq's capital city? And for that, let's check in with CNN's Miles O'Brien. He's with our military expert, Miles. Judy, thank you very much. I'm joined by a couple of retired generals, David Grange and Don Shepard, Army and Air Force respectively. And what we'd like to do is take a walk through the map here, give you the big picture. But before we do that, I want to ask Don Shepard just quickly about this GPS jamming, uh, the possibility that the Iraqis may have it. The U.S. relies heavily on these satellite-guided bombs. How, is it practical to jam it, and how can, that, how can the jamming itself be thwarted? Yeah, it's a problem, and we know how to work around it. It doesn't mean it's 100% fixed, but on the other hand, these are not GPS-guided weapons. They're GPS-assisted. It reverts to the inertial navigation system in both the airplane and the weapon if they're jammed. We have tactics around it. We've made some hardware and software fixes as well, Miles, so we think we have a solution for this that's workable. All right, let's start down. Uh, thank you for clarifying that point. Let's start down in the very narrow Iraqi coastline, only about 19 miles down there. We're talking about Umm Qasr and uh, what's going on down there as we move up toward Basra. Give us your, uh, David Grange, once you start, give us the situation as best we know it down in that part of the world. Well, I understand that they've cleared most of the, uh, the waters around the port so they can bring in humanitarian assistance. There's still some demining that must be done. Uh, there's been some fierce fights there because there's uh, the Ba'ath Party holdouts in some of the built-up areas and that caused some intense fighting with uh, commando units. All right. Uh, situation not st uh, stable just yet. Getting close, but it's always going to be uh, security operations, even if it's a week from now. All right. Want well, us to move up toward Basra, Nasiriyah, Don Basra, Shepard. The second largest city in Iraq, 1.2 million people. Uh, the military decided to bypass Basra and then clean it up later. Same thing's happening there. The Fedayeen militias in Basra, as well as some special Republican Guard units, or at least elements of them, that will cause us problems. This is going to have to be bypassed and cleaned up later. And we have to be very cautious as our units move north about their rear areas and flanks. All right. So so the possibility of being surrounded is always there. You've got to guard against that. Always there. Happened yesterday. All right. David Grange, Nasiriya. Nasiriya. Now, one thing I think it's important uh, to consider when you're looking at Basra and Nasiriya is that the units, as they countered more resistance than was expected, uh, instead of wasting more troops going in to clear urban areas, they have controlled these by from a distance. They've isolated them. They found river crossing sites near the city instead of going through the city to continue their maneuver north so they have freedom of maneuver right but at the same time they still can isolate and control the area without going in and clearing every building all right so the attempt is to contain that but that's perhaps easier said than done no they can contain it you're still going to have some rear area security issues but you have to continue maneuver or you'll never win the war all right in other words you get bogged down just holding these exactly cities. all right let's move up to uh, the Karbala area we don't have that labeled there but what we're talking about this part of the world right here. What's going on in Karbala right now? Well, basically what happened uh, yesterday was uh, there was a, an attack by the helicopter, uh, uh, elements of the 11th uh, aviation uh, under the 5th Corps, and basically they made a helicopter attack against southern flanks of a brigade of the Medina Division. They ran into withering fire, much of it coming from populated areas in this area, and they are now regrouping, and they're going to uh, the interesting thing has happened here. You have tactics that you try, and then you modify those tactics. So I assume that they're going to be looking at what happened, uh, doing an after action on this thing, and deciding how to combine heavy air power as well as helicopters in the future as we move north toward Baghdad. And we forgot Najaf as well, which is just a little bit to the south of there. What should we bring yeah, up there? Yeah, on Najaf, Najaf, Kabola, it's just a lot of fighting. It's the forward uh, outer defenses of the 
the Republican Guards, Medina, Medina Division, uh, Armored Division, uh, the best tanks uh, and armored personnel carriers that the Iraqi military has. Now, what has not been re uh, reported uh, as well as I think it should have been, and we're looking at all, all the targets in downtown Baghdad, a lot of enemy armor and, and, and troop units were destroyed in these attacks, though the helicopters took a lot of fire, weather yeah. and fire, as Don said. They also inflicted uh, a lot of casualties on the enemy. Okay, well, that's worth pointing out. Now, as we move toward Baghdad, they're calling this the red zone here. Why is that? Well, uh, this is where the Republican Guard is and the Special Republican Guard, those closest to Saddam, where the loyalties are, are probably the strongest towards Saddam, and his better divisions up there. We saw the Medina Division down here at Karbala we ran into last night, uh, the Hammurabi Division. Uh, other divisions will be around Baghdad here. We'll be encountering those. Now, of importance is the heavy air power from the Air Force and Navy Day is starting to be employed against those units ringing Baghdad. As they mass in anticipation of United States forces attacking, they become targets and reportedly 700 of the 1,000 sorties today are going against those uh, units out there across the country. All right. How much concern is there that as this thrust moves toward Baghdad, that, that those forces inside that red zone there will sort of hang back and lure U.S. forces into that city? Uh, I don't think it's a lure as much as this is a delaying tactic, delaying from Basra, Nazaria, Najouf, Kabbalah, all the way back into the outskirts of Baghdad. It's the only way they can survive is to hide among civilians, use populated areas, work restricted terrain like around bridge crossing sites as they fall back on Baghdad. So it's not so much as a lure, it's a way they have to fight. All right, briefly, let's talk about the 101st Airborne. They're out here. I, we don't know where they are, right? They're somewhere out here, we think. Right. Uh, what are they going to do? What's, how are they going to play? Are they going to head north like this, perhaps move back down onto Baghdad this way, or what? Well, I think what uh, is important is they have the capability to do all of those things. Yeah. Uh, they have uh, a lot of flexibility and combat power that has yet to be applied against, in full, against Iraqi forces. Don Shepard? Yeah, and uh, the other thing is we have other United States and coalition forces closing at the same time as reinforcements to be used as battles develop. And the closer we get to downtown Baghdad, the more likely you are to encounter weapons of mass uh, destruction, chemical, biological, if they are to be employed. Right, that's an ominous note. Let's talk briefly about what's going on in the north. Some, some we do not know of troops on the ground there. Not huge numbers. What does that mean? What are yeah. they going to be doing? Two airfields being used. They're, they're moving in. Uh, they have soft on the ground. The idea is to work with the Kurds, uh -huh. to start working procedures for calling in fires, to, to movement of, let's say, indigenous forces uh, against the Iraqis, and making sure there's uh, control of fire so there's not fire, fi uh, friendly fire incidents, and to continue some pressure on the north. And I think you'll see that building up. Yeah, indeed, and I think uh, there has to be a northern front. We're beginning to move troops in there. It'll become clear in the next few days uh, what kind of troops are going to go in there in miles and assist as they move south toward Baghdad. All right, so briefly then, you've got a thrust here, uh, a couple of columns coming that direction, potentially the 101st Airborne this direction, possibly something this way. How important is that timing on that squeeze plane toward Baghdad? The timing will be the results of, one, the plan, or the adjusted plan as they encounter enemy forces, on a battlefield. The other is resources available. Some things may not be ready to go yet. So they have to time it according to what resources are ready to launch. And again, there's only so much stuff to move troops, whether it be vehicles, helicopters, airplanes. So they have to synchronize it with the resources and the enemy situation. All right. So basically what you're talking about is whoever gets there first might have to wait a little bit until well, all this comes together, this synchronicity. Well, you'll never have a unit go blasting into Baghdad or right in the outskirts of Baghdad unless other conditions are set up for success. All right. Don Shepard, you want to add on that? Well, they're going to be coordinated at the end toward Baghdad, but much depends on what the enemy does and what the populace does. The populace is starting to turn against the Iraqi forces. We saw it in Umkasser. I predict it will happen in Basra and Nazaria. Uh, the thugs that have been controlling these people, the Fedayeen, the people will eventually turn against them. It will be slow as they see the, administ the Iraqi administration lose control of their country. That's a key point. That's a key point. All right, Don Shepard, Dave Grange, excellent work. Thank you for giving us the big picture. That helps me understand it quite a bit. Wolf? You know, before the generals go, Miles, let me ask them both a question that's been going through my mind over the past hour. As we showed our viewers this news conference in Baghdad, Tariq Aziz, the deputy prime minister of Iraq, the first appearance he's had since the start of this war, clearly railing against the U.S. and British forces, clearly uh, insisting that the Iraqi troops are moving along, clearly trying to inspire his forces if you will, insisting Saddam Hussein has control and that all of the ministers are, control of, in, are in control of their various 
sectors. The military-related question, let me start with you, General Shepard, and, and then you can bring in General Grange, is this. This kind of news conference by the Deputy Prime Minister, clearly seen on Iraqi television, does have an impact on the people of Iraq and the military forces of Iraq, and presumably encouraging them to fight the U.S. and British forces who are moving in. Why doesn't the U.S. military take out Iraqi television and end these kinds of uh, opportunities for the Iraqi regime to be broadcasting these kinds of messages? They could easily do that if they wanted to, General Shepard. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, Wolf, we were just asked that question on the floor here, and we're all guessing. I suspect that the United States, uh, which can take those things out anytime they want, is interested in hearing what's going on in Iraq right now. They have the ability to do it anytime. When General Franks is ready to take that down, he'll be able to. And the basic is, I can't answer your question. General Grange, uh, do you want to weigh in and, uh, and offer your opinion? Well, I think that Don's right. I think that what you're saying is uh, uh, some information that is good to have uh, on what's, what their attitudes are and what they're doing. So I think it's, uh, it's probably good to keep them going right now. Then they can change their mind at any time and uh, I think target some of these uh, people if they wanted to. All right, General Grange and General Shepard, thanks uh, very much. The downside, of course, is that it could have an impact in encouraging Iraqi soldiers to resist uh, encouraging them in pep talks, if you will, on Iraqi television, showing that the regime, the government of President Saddam Hussein, still very much in business. Thanks uh, to the generals. Thanks to Miles O'Brien. Judy, back to you. Thanks, Wolf. I don't think any of us would ever, would ever begin to suggest that the uh, complicated uh, a uh, scenario unfolding in Iraq uh, with group troops on the ground, with uh, planes in the air, ships at sea, could be reduced to some arrows and some circles. But it is the case that uh, this drawing, this map, does help uh, the rest of us understand, uh, in, in large part, uh, at least the direction that the U.S. Uh, and the uh, coalition forces are driving. Well, for all the uh, the things that troops that uh, the generals have to deal with, something that they probably wish they didn't have to think about, but they certainly do, is Mother Nature. Uh, let's turn to Chad Myers at the Weather Board uh, in Atlanta. Uh, Chad, give us a sense of uh, the fact that there may be more sandstorms coming. You bet, Judy. A, a big storm coming in from the west. And we call them sandstorms because in the North America we think about sand on a beach. That sand on the beach is really big compared to what these guys are going to deal with. You have to think about this almost like creamer, like coffee creamer about that big, the size there, getting into everything, getting into the guns, getting into the weapons, getting in, obviously, into the helicopters, slowing things down. Not like the sand on a beach that you see, which is actually much larger in grain size, only it takes about 20 miles per hour to pick up this dust. Well, today the winds are going to blow from the south at 20 to 30, especially by late tonight into tomorrow, and then a cold front is going to come ripping in from the Mediterranean, shifting the winds to the west at almost 40 miles per hour. So things are really going to get mixed up. All of this dust is going to get messed around, and visibility is going to get less than a half a mile in most locations from Baghdad south all the way into Kuwait City. This is a classic situation, a low coming out of Europe and a low coming across the Sahara. Sometimes we look at these in North America and call them nor'easters. They're just not a northeast coast here. The two storms will merge right in the eastern Mediterranean. Two storms that get together always make one larger storm than the two separated. And as they combine, Judy, they're going to head on up toward the northeast, cause those south winds tomorrow, going to kick up wind from Kuwait City right up into Baghdad. And then by Tuesday afternoon into Wednesday, the dust comes ripping in from the west. Now, the good news is by Wednesday and Thursday, it's all over but a couple big days of big winds and low visibility. Back so, Chad, as best you can tell, Chad, uh, this is just a couple of days, yes. right? Probably less than 24 hours. Things begin to settle down, although that, that sand is so fine that dust actually stays in the air. It hangs in the air for at least another 24 hours, even after the winds calm down. I don't think there's anything we have to compare with no. it uh, in the United States. No, nothing really, because our sand is so much heavier than the sand out here. Even if you're on a beach and the wind blows, you kind of feel it, you get sandblasted. This is more right. just dust in the air all over the place, getting rid of the, the visibility down to almost zero. The visibility, and it gets into the equipment. Sure does. All right. Chad Myers, thanks very much. Uh, well, while we're watching uh, the weather, we are also keeping a close eye today on the financial markets. I think many people were commenting last week how striking it was that as the war was getting underway, as young American men and women lives were uh, put at risk, the stock market was
climbing last week. Well, look at what it is doing today. Right now, the Dow Jones Industrials down more than 300 points, 310 points. Uh, Rhonda Schaffler is with us uh, from the floor of the exchange. Rhonda, I saw a commentary over the weekend uh, from some saying that they, they thought that initially investors saw this as a quick, easy war, if you will, and over the weekend with additional casualties, uh, with the realization that it's going to take some time, uh, frankly, reality has settled in. That's it exactly, Judy. I mean, this is the day where investors are getting a reality check. And let's face it, the market had that huge rally that, even in the best of times, some would have called unsustainable. Today, a lot of people thinking about the news developments over the weekend, some of the caution that we heard from leaders, including President Bush, saying this will not be a quick war. So this is why you're seeing some real second-guessing on Wall Street. And this particular loss on the Dow is severe. We're looking at session lows, as you pointed out, down better than 300 points. We have not seen a 300-point sell-off on Wall Street since back in September, and it's across the board selling. The Nasdaq sharply lower, too. But again, keep this in mind, Wall Street is coming off its best week in 20 years. Last week, the Dow did surge 8.4 percent in the best of times. We would expect to retreat like this. Oil prices sharply higher, and for the same reason, stocks are sliding. Setbacks on the battlefield. U.S. benchmark crude is up more than a dollar a barrel. Last week, oil was tumbling 25 percent to a four-month low. Now, while investors are dumping stocks as well as watching oil closely, they are buying bonds and gold in what we call flight to quality. Investors are pricing more uncertainty about the war into the market. War is also taking a heavy toll on the airline industry. Delta is now saying it's cutting its domestic and international flight schedule by about 12 percent. It blames a steep decline in passenger demand because of the military action in Iraq. Delta says it hopes to reinstate the entire schedule as soon as passenger demand improves. Once again, Dow tumbling better than 300 points. That's it from here. Back to you now, Judy. All right, uh, Rhonda Schaffler with the very latest from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Now let's quickly get back to Kuwait and to Wolf. Thanks very much, Judy. Explosions, as our viewers know, were once again heard tonight in Baghdad. And it's possible, possible Saddam Hussein's elite Republican Guard units are spending a lot of time dodging U.S. airstrikes. CNN's Gary Tuckman is at an air base near the Iraqi border, and he's joining us now live. Uh, Gary, it's a busy night once again for the pilots where you are. Well, this is the fourth night in a row we've experienced a very busy night. No let up at all with the warplanes rolling down the runway at this base. During our days embedded with the U.S. Air Force, we have seen hundreds of warplanes heading towards Iraq, but we've seen even more bombs and missiles. To our civilian eyes, it looks like an endless supply of munitions. They come by truck via carts to the warplanes behind me. These are A-10 attack craft, and you can see on the bottom of the wing, you can see that's where the munitions are loaded. The bombs and the missiles are put under the wing. You may remember some of our loyal viewers. A few months ago, we did some live reports at the Army Ammunition Plant in McAllister, Oklahoma. That's the facility that makes all holiness. They estimate that today, Monday into Tuesday morning, there will be 1,000 sorties from warplanes to Iraq that drop bombs or missiles on Iraq. Of those 1,000, we are being told 800 of them will concentrate in the Baghdad area, and their particular concentration will be Republican Guard troops. Now, yesterday we told you about some helicopters that took off from this particular base we're at on a search and rescue mission. As it turns out, it was two search and rescue missions, but yesterday the Air Force would not tell us what they were. We have now learned what they were. The first search and rescue mission that these HH-60 helicopters known as Jollies, and they're known as Jollies because during the Vietnam War area, era, they were known as Jolly Green Giants. They call them Jollies now. But the first mission they went on yesterday was looking for two British airmen who were missing after their... British tornado plane was shot down. They weren't able to find them, and it turns out, tragically, the plane was shot down by a Patriot missile launcher. That's what you used to shoot down the Iraqi missiles that accidentally shot the British tornado plane. The two men are missing. They are presumed dead. The other search and rescue mission was more successful. There were seven Special Operations Force members who were pinned down among the enemy. The helicopter swooped down, picked them up, extracted them, brought them back to this base, and they are now safe. 
As we said, it is still very busy here. They're estimating at this particular base alone another 300 sorties in the 24-hour period ending tomorrow. Wolf, back to you. Gary Tuckman at a very busy and noisy air base near the Iraqi border here in the Persian Gulf. Gary, thanks very much. Let's go back to Judy in Washington. Thanks, Wolf. Well, as we uh, watch, uh, always uh, fascinating these reports, uh, not, uh, not only from the air bases, uh, but the, uh, uh, the carriers at sea. Uh, we are ever mindful uh, that as this war goes on, the White House uh, paying attention to what's going on in the field, but also watching public opinion uh, very closely. There have been a number of polls done just recently, and a new one uh, just being released uh, by CNN shows an interesting, uh, some interesting uh, changes, if you will, in U.S. public opinion. Our Bill Schneider is with us uh, from Atlanta uh, for the very latest. Bill, our senior political analyst, you there? There you I are. I am here. Well, Judy, what we did was poll people over the weekend and found that just as with the stock market, there's been a reality check in public opinion. On Saturday, the war outlook was really euphoric. It looked like Americans were going to have an easy time of it. Uh, and you can see here, 74 percent said they favored the war with Iraq. On Sunday, we found by a lot of indicators, Americans had had a reality check. They expected more Americans to be killed. They thought the war would take longer. But look at this, still 70 percent say they favor war with Iraq. So morale is holding up on the home front, even though Americans have come to the realization this war is going to last longer and it may ha create more casualties. But the, the public is holding up in its support. And, and Bill, is this a typical pattern uh, during uh, uh, the early stages of, of uh, combat? During the early stages it is, particularly where Americans have a strong sense of mission. Uh, it, this doesn't really happen uh, in a case where they think there is no real mission. In Somalia, a few Americans were killed and the, the vision of those shocking casualties led Americans to say, get out of there as quickly as possible. What are we doing in Somalia? Because we had come in on a humanitarian mission and the image of those casualties was shocking to Americans. Well, these images were also shocking, but in this case, Americans believe we know what we're doing. The president has defined a very precise mission. It was driven by an attack on the United States, most Americans believe, that is 9-11, and so they're willing to stick with it, as we just saw in that poll. And particularly interesting, Bill, because uh, the information uh, that we're getting now about the number of casualties, we've seen those numbers go up over the weekend, and, uh, and it will be interesting to watch uh, to see uh, to what extent that, that support holds. All right, Bill Schneider is our senior uh, political analyst uh, with us uh, for coverage today. Bill is working out of Atlanta. We're going to take a very short break. Our continuing coverage of this war continues. Leon Harris back right around the corner with a look at the headlines. It's been 140 years since we began crossing this land. In that time, we've used more than our share of ingenuity and tenacity to build a company and a nation. And together, we've overcome challenges the size of mountains. Applying for a second mortgage is fast and easy with Ditech.com. One of the things that we liked about Ditech were the competitive rates and closing costs. In addition, we were able to take a second mortgage, which is very convenient. If you need cash to consolidate bills or pay off high interest credit cards, apply now for a second mortgage with a no closing cost option from Ditech.com. I recommend Ditech to everyone. They're really nice people to work with. Ditech.com. Call 1 800 71 Fixed. CNN Tonight, the battle intensifies as the coalition marches toward Baghdad. The latest live from the front lines, plus Colonel David Hackworth, Senator Richard Shelby, and more. Only on Larry King Live, CNN Tonight, 9 Eastern. Hello, folks. I'm Leon Harris here at the CNN Center's newsroom, and here is the latest we have on the war with Iraq. One of the men considered closest to Saddam Hussein is confirmed now to be alive. He says the Iraqi leadership is in good shape and the president is in, quote, full control. Tariq Aziz hosted a news conference in Baghdad a while ago, and there had been some speculation that Aziz had been killed in that attack last Wednesday night on a Baghdad leadership bunker. 
Another Iraqi official is predicting his country will become a military quagmire. UN envoy Mohammed al Duri spoke to CNN's Richard Roth. I don't think it will be a short war. If, uh, uh, if the American will not stop this aggression, the war will continue for years. A purported speech by Saddam Hussein has aired on Iraqi television, and in it, he praises Iraqi fighters and says the Allied forces are in trouble. White House says the speech is being analyzed right now to try and determine when it was taped. Now, as you know, there's been speculation that the Iraqis use body doubles who pose as the president. There have also been reports that he was seriously wounded in that initial attack by airstrikes last Wednesday. A military source says that American Patriot missiles have downed three more Iraqi missiles flying over Kuwait. What you're looking at here is an animation that approximates just how that whole system works. The three successful shootdowns followed the accidental downing of a British warplane that killed two British pilots yesterday. An update now on some of the casualties. The British government has announced the death of a soldier in the ongoing fighting around the southern city of Basra. That is the first reported death of the war of a British soldier in combat. As we've reported here, 10 U.S. Marines were killed in action yesterday in Nasriya. And some of the Kurds in northern Iraq are taking cover in caves. This group of Kurdish civilians told CNN's Jane Araf that they support the United States and they fear chemical attacks by Iraq. United States airstrikes are picking up pace in that region. And today, the U.S. announced the official arrival of ground troops in northern Iraq. Now, at this hour, we're keeping our eye on Wall Street. And as you see here, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is off significantly. It is down 300 points. His trading has gone uh, pretty much uh, negatively all day. The NASDAQ is also down. The S&P is down as well. The reports are telling us that uh, investors are revising their earlier optimism concerning the war. We'll keep our eye on that so you keep your eye on us. We are bringing you live coverage of the war in Iraq right here on CNN 24 hours a day. And when you're away from the television, there is always CNN.com where you'll find our war tracker. Just click on the interactive maps there and keep track of the action on the front lines. You can also find re field reports from our reporters who are out there in the war zones. Again, all of that is at CNN.com. And now, CNN's coverage of Strike on Iraq continues. Good afternoon and good evening uh, from here. It's 10 p.m. here in Kuwait City as well as in Baghdad, where the news is being made this Monday, March 24th. Hello, I'm Wolf Blitzer. Coming up this hour, a show of survival today from Saddam Hussein. This is videotape that aired this morning on Iraqi television. What is clear is the leader is rallying his troops, calling for victory against the Americans. What's not clear is if this was a recent taping. The big question, is the Iraqi leader still alive, or is all of this just propaganda? From CNN Studios in Washington, I'm Judy Woodruff. Also this hour, American POWs, the story of Americans under Iraqi control. We'll hear from one of the families in Texas this hour. And from CNN's World Headquarters in Atlanta, I'm Miles O'Brien. Also this hour, the Apache helicopter. Central Command Center says one of them is down in Iraq with the pilots still unaccounted for. So what could the Iraqis do with it and them? We'll take a look at the chopper in about 15 minutes. But first, back to Wolf in Kuwait City. Wolf? Thanks very much, Miles. In a briefing today, we brought you live here on CNN. The central, commanding, com central commander, the uh, General Tommy Franks, described coalition advances thus far. And he said this, rapid and in some cases, dramatic. But as we near the end of day five, Dramatic also describes the attacks and counterattacks being launched by Iraqi defenders. At times today, U.S. Apache helicopters battled Iraqi Republican Guard units just 50 miles, 50 miles, give or take, from Baghdad. One of those Apaches was down, and its two-man crew is now listed as MIA, missing in action. The area around Nasiriyah in southern Iraq is a battlefield as well. A day after 10 U.S. Marines, maybe more, were killed there and several GIs captured. Let's get the latest now uh, from the Pentagon. Our correspondent there, Barbara Starr, is standing by. Barbara? Wolf, another busy day of event, uh, perhaps the most interesting very recently, as you pointed out, uh, Iraq's Deputy Prime Minister Tarek Aziz appeared on Baghdad TV demonstrating not only that he is alive, but that the Iraqi regime, he insists, remains in control. 
Saddam Hussein has full control over his country and over the armed forces and the uh, Iraqi people and all the resources of Iraq, natural, res natural resources of Iraq, and also the uh, socialist and uh, socialist nationalist Ba'ath Party, and we are with, with them, all, we are all in control, each one of us is in complete control over the ministry or the sector of responsibility that he or she has. But earlier in the day in Qatar, General Tommy Franks, of course, the head of the U.S. Central Command, had quite a different view. As you know, our forces have been moving rapidly. We've intentionally bypassed enemy formations to include paramilitary and the Fedahin. And so you can expect that our cleanup operations are going to be ongoing uh, for uh, or, uh, uh, across the days in, in the future. Now, General Franks underscored a couple of themes about where things stand right now. Most of the resistance, he says, is continuing to come from irregular forces, the Fedayeen, the paramilitary, and other perhaps Republican Guard troops that have infiltrated into the South. Uh, he said that is to be expected and that the U.S. strategy will be to continue to move around the cities as the U.S. moves closer to Baghdad to try and avoid encountering some of these forces. And indeed, Wolf, as you pointed out, U.S. forces now as they press forward, perhaps within 50 miles of Baghdad in the southern suburbs, that being, of course, the place where U.S. forces launched that Apache helicopter air assault against the Republican Guard Medina Division, which is now said to be dug in around the city of Karbala south of Baghdad. They have not yet approached them on the ground, but that air operation, that air assault operation, resulting in the uh, apparent uh, downing of some sort of one Apache helicopter and now the two-man crew, their fate unknown. And of course, uh, finally, on the chemical and biological weapons, it's very interesting to note exploitation teams, that's what they call them, military exploitation teams, have now moved into Iraq searching these, some of these suspected WMD sites. They are moving through them, trying to gather what intelligence they can, seeing what they can find. We are told so far, no specific contact with any chemical or biological weapons. Wolf? Barbara, on that uh, Apache helicopter, we saw a videotape uh, that the Iraqis put on television. That helicopter looked to be in pretty good shape physically from the outside. It didn't look like it had been shot down or destroyed or anything. It looked pretty robust, suggesting that there could have been perhaps a mechanical problem that forced the pilots to bring that plane down. Both of those pilots now listed as missing in action. Uh, is it the sense that there might have been a mechanical problem, A, and B, is it normal stan standard operating procedure to let that helicopter sit there like that, or is it the standard operating procedure to try to destroy it, given some of the high technology that could be compromised by the Iraqis? Well, uh, yes, on both points, Wolf. Indeed, many officials looking at the videotape from what they can see would describe it as a mechanical downing, as it were, rather than combat fire. No apparent visible damage, and it looks like it came down upright. So that's their thinking at the moment. And yes, to the second question, uh, it is a very high-tech piece of equipment. The U.S. would not want to see uh, much of the electronics fall into Iraqi hands. Uh, typically, in these cases, indeed, that's what the U.S. military does. After a helicopter or some type of expensive uh, high-tech equipment falls into enemy territory, airstrikes are called in to destroy it. Uh, this one, we'll just have to wait and see. The interesting fact is it appears to be in somewhat of a populated area. There were people around the wreckage very quickly after this all unfolded. So we don't know exactly where it came down, but we'll be watching to see if, in fact, it is struck by U.S. aircraft and destroyed. All right, Barbara Starr at the Pentagon, thanks very much. Let's go back to Judy in Washington. Judy? Thanks, Wolf. With that particular helicopter aside, as you and Barbara were, uh, were discussing, U.S. attack helicopters did come under heavy fire today as they ventured into the far southern outskirts of Baghdad. They were going after a heavily armed Iraqi Republican Guard unit, and the Guard, we're told, wasn't giving an inch. CNN's Carl Penhall is embedded with the 11th 
attack helicopter regiment of the U.S. Army's 5th Corps. And we got an, when he got an opportunity, he phoned in this report. What I can tell you is that the other Apache helicopters that flew alongside that uh, came under heavy anti-aircraft fire as they flew a mission <clears throat> to attack Republican Guard positions around the town of Kabbalah. The aim of the mission was to destroy some T-72 tank emplacements, up to 90 T-72 tanks in that region, um, and some heavy artillery pieces. But as the helicopters flew into the target area, uh, they came under heavy uh, anti-aircraft fire, both from military emplacements and also, commanders say, from residential areas. In an effort not to target civilians or cause possible civilian death, then many of the helicopters didn't unleash their Hellfire missiles for fear of destroying homes and, and, and the like. On return to the airfield where these Apache helicopters are now, the pilots throughout the day today have been assessing the damage that they received to their craft. Uh, not one of them has escaped without a, a, a bullet impact. Most of them have anything between 10 and 20 uh, bullet impacts. One even had an engine blown off by a rocket-propelled grenade. So again, the, these, a lot of these pilots are, are feeling that they, they were very lucky, though talking to one of the unit commanders, uh, Colonel Daniel Ball, he says he's been very impressed by his men in this initial combat. says he never expected the Republican Guard to fold, and, and although there is damage, significant damage in some cases to some of these helicopters, uh, Colonel Ball says that uh, efforts are going ahead to replace the, uh, to repair the aircraft, and he says he's ready to continue the fight against the Republican Guard, which he sees as one of the crucial battles of the war, given that this Medina division of Republican Guard uh, controls the approaches, the southern approaches to Baghdad. Very interesting uh, reporting from Carl Penhall, who's embedded with the 11th attack. Uh, helicopter regiment uh, of the uh, U.S. Army's 5th Corps. Very interesting that he said not a single one of those uh, choppers came back with fewer than 10 or 20 bullet holes in them. And, of course, one of them uh, lost an engine altogether. Uh, let's go back to Wolf now. Thanks very much, Judy. In an obvious effort to show his survival, the Iraqi President Saddam Hussein appeared on Iraqi television today trying to rally his people and voicing some strong words against his enemies. We don't know, however, when that tape was uh, made. CNN's Reem Brahimi, though, has more details on the speech. She's covering things now from Amman, Jordan. The Iraqi president's speech appearing to address a variety of audiences. First, the international community, Iraqi President Saddam Hussein saying Iraq has shown goodwill, has been patient, but now it is being invaded and attacked. Secondly, addressing the region, the Arab world and probably the Muslim world at large, saying that this is a battle of believers. Let's listen in. The victory is soon. These decisive days, O oh you Iraqis, are in line with what God has ordered you to cut their throats. And those who are the believers will be victorious. Shortly after the president's address, Iraq's information minister spoke to reporters and gave out a recent count of Iraqi casualties throughout the country. 382 wounded and 62 killed total. Not clear, however, whether these were military or civilian casualties. Mohammed Saeed the Sahaf also warned there would be darker days ahead for U.S. and British troops in Iraq. He also said Iraq had downed two U.S. Apache helicopters and might show the pilots at a later stage if convenient, and then went on to denounce the United States for what he said were double standards in its handling of prisoners of war. This is only the first round. We will show more of their captives. And they are all being treated according to the Geneva Convention. Finally, the minister accused the United States of wrongfully referring to international conventions at a time when its troops were on Iraqi soil as an invading force.
Reem Rahimi, CNN, Amman, Jordan. U.S. intelligence sources say there's reason to believe the most recent appearance of Saddam Hussein was indeed him, not a double. But when was it actually taped? That remains a mystery. Our national security correspondent, David Ensor, is joining us now live from Washington with some analysis. David? Well, Wolf, there's, there's an element of public relations battle going on here between the two sides. You have on the one hand uh, Tarek Aziz saying in his news conference that uh, the, uh, the West, uh, the, the U.S. officials are using what he called cheap methods to lie to the American people and to the world uh, and try to suggest that Saddam Hussein may no longer be alive. On the other hand, talking to U.S. officials who are analyzing the tapes closely, they say that all the tapes that have come out of Saddam Hussein that have been shown on Iraqi television since the first bombing occurred, are n none of them are absolute proof that he's still alive. This latest one, they say, uh, he, he does refer to fighting in the South. That's true. Uh, but he, uh, he does, he, in some cases, uh, credits units of the Iraqi military that, it, that are not actually, have not actually been fighting. Uh, they also point to jump cuts in the tape, suggesting that it might have been recorded earlier and doctored to fit current circumstances. And U.S. officials do say that they know for a fact that Saddam Hussein recorded a number of television messages just prior to the fighting. So they, they just basically say they do, these tapes do not prove that he's still alive. Now, having said that, uh, when you talk to U.S. intelligence officials, uh, the consensus at the moment is he probably is alive. And analysts who follow it closely say that they believe that if Saddam Hussein were dead and if enough people knew that, they believe this regime would start to fall apart. So their assumption is, the working assumption, is that Saddam Hussein is still alive. Now there's mixed evidence. There's some suggesting he might have been injured during the initial bombing. And on that, officials say they really just don't know. Wolf? All right, David Ensor are doing some serious analysis for us. Thanks, David. We're going to continue to monitor the story. We'll get back to you. In the meantime, let's go back to Judy in Washington. Thanks, Wolf. Well, yesterday, we know that the U.S. Central Command said that a U.S. Army six-vehicle supply convoy was ambushed by Iraqi forces in southern Iraq near Nasiriya, and the 12 soldiers couldn't be accounted for. Accounted for. Well, later in the day, Al Jazeera, the Arab language satellite network, transmitted a video that was shot by state-run Iraqi television of gruesome pictures of several dead soldiers and interviews with five captured Americans. CNN made the decision not to show video of the dead soldiers and instead will air these two images with no identifiable features. In the video transmitted, it was apparent that some sol soldiers had been shot, some of them in the forehead. CNN decided not to air any video of the captured soldiers until the network was certain that the families of the POWs had been contacted. Now, the Pentagon asked that those interviews not be shown. But CNN has decided, as we learn that families have been notified, notified that we would air brief audio and video from the POWs because coverage of their treatment is an important part of the coverage of the war in Iraq. The mother of Army Specialist Joseph Hudson, Anasita Hudson, says that she saw the video of the interviews with the captured soldiers on a Filipino TV channel that she subscribes to. Mrs. Hudson told CNN on Sunday that she had just found out from her daughter-in-law that her son had been moved out of Kuwait. I asked her, I said, is not this Joe okay? You took to him? I said, yeah, uh, they're okay, but they moved him from Kuwait to somewhere else. They're not saying it in the telephone because it's against the rules. And then now I find out that he's been captured in Iraq. Today, CNN has learned that two more of the families of the five POWs have now been notified. PFC Miller? PSV Miller? Proud First Class Miller. What's your name? Shana. Shana? Yes. Where are, do you come from? Texas. Now, Miller's family in Kansas says that they heard from the military that their son and brother was a POW. His brother and sister say the family is scared, but they're thinking positively. Even, even now, I try to stay optimistic. And instead of being killed, he was captured. And with him being captured, he's not on the field to be killed. My brother's a fighter and always has been. I mean, he'd give up his life for anybody. 
Can't imagine how difficult that is. Shoshana Johnson's family, meanwhile, told NBC's Today Show that she is from Fort Bliss. She is a single mother with a two-year-old daughter and that she is a chef in the Army and she loves to cook. Reacting to the release of the video by the Iraqis, U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld said that the Iraqis are in violation of the Geneva Conventions. That agreement prohibits nations from humiliating and degrading prisoners of war. Later, the Iraqis issued a statement saying that they would honor the Geneva Conventions and treat all POWs humanely. And again, we heard that repeated just recently by the Iraqi ambassador to the United Nations. Now, some of those captured are with the 507th Maintenance Company of the Army, which is not considered a combat unit, and it is based at Fort Bliss, Texas, as we've been telling you, and that's where we find CNN's Brian Cabell today. Brian, by now, all these families uh, have been talked to. Yeah, they have. We, we haven't talked to them, and there's actually a vacuum of information here at Fort Bliss, I should tell you that, Judy. Uh, they've had press conferences scheduled here for the last two days, and both of those press conferences have now been canceled, the one today postponed. They say they simply aren't getting enough information from the Department of Defense or Department of Army, and until they get that information here at Fort Bliss, they will not hold a press conference. So an army of media is here awaiting any further information on these 12 missing individuals. As you say, they're, they're all from the 507th Maintenance Company here on this uh, post. That's a group that takes care of Humvees, they take care of trucks, they take care of generators. We're told the company consists of perhaps 100 to 150 soldiers. And as you say, uh, five of them apparently now POWs. As for the fate of the other seven, we simply don't know. That's some of the information that we are awaiting here at Ford Bliss. The three names, as you indicated, that have been given out so far that we are giving out because we know that the families have been uh, notified. Specialist Shoshana Johnson, 30 years old, a, a mother of, of one child, a chef. She's been uh, in the Army for some five years. Specialist Joseph Hudson, 23 years old. He has a wife and a daughter. He's from El Paso. And uh, PFC Patrick Miller, 23 years old. He's a welder by trade from Wichita, Kansas. He has a wife and two young children, one of them four years old, another one only seven months old. And his family, as you indicated, has seen pictures of him as a POW in the last day. We're glad he wasn't killed. Uh, we hope he makes it back. Uh, we all love him. And we just hope that uh, they treat him humanely. Most of the families have gathered here at Fort Bliss. They are getting help from the Red Cross, from the chaplain, from social workers as well, any sort of help they need in this, uh, in this time of need for them. One of them in particular having uh, a lot of difficulty. We've talked to her. She is the mother of uh, Specialist Hudson. She is undergoing uh, kidney dialysis today, and she is awaiting a kidney transplant. And now she learns that her son is captured a POW of the Iraqis. A very, very difficult time for her. A very difficult time for this entire post, as a matter of fact, Judy. 12,000 people here, about 4,500 have been deployed overseas. 400, in fact, left for the theater just yesterday. Uh, Brian, we can't say this often enough. Uh, none of us can even imagine uh, the pain uh, that these families are feeling, uh, knowing that their loved ones uh, are still alive, as best we know, but in the hands uh, of the Iraqis. So uh, our hearts and our prayers are with all of them. And as I throw to Miles in Atlanta, we want to tell you that there are sirens going off uh, in Baghdad right now. These live pictures coming in through the night scope in Baghdad. There have been sirens going off, and uh, we don't know whether that indicates anything or not. We are watching it very closely, monitoring it, and as soon as uh, we have some information, we'll bring that to you. Uh, but Miles, again, uh, I think back to, uh, to the families who thought they were sending their loved ones over there as welders and mechanics and cooks or chefs, uh, and come to find out that they are right in the middle of it. As unlikely as you would think it would be, that's exactly the situation they're in. It's, uh, it's a tough situation for all concerned. Still to come this hour, Judy, we'll look at those Apache helicopters. Central Command says one of them is down, its crew is missing, the Iraqis uh, have it, but what, if anything, could they do with it? Maybe it's already destroyed by the U.S. military. We'll ask our expert, Don Shepard, about that. Also this hour, inside the caves of northern Iraq, seen as Jane Arath takes you there like no other network can. See what it's like to be a refugee of Saddam Hussein's regime. And a little later, contacting families a world away. One man's effort to keep U.S. troops and families close together 
You are watching CNN, the most trusted name in news. Time to leave. Gotta get rid of this pain fast. The moment of choice, Tylenol or Advil? Which will work better on muscle aches? Truth is, with Advil liquid gels, you can feel better faster. Only Advil liquid gels give you advanced, liquid-filled capsules that work faster, stronger, better than Tylenol on tough pain. Advil liquid gels rush relief where you need it. Gentle on your stomach, too. For better relief, advance to Advil. Think all mortgage lenders are the same? Think again. At Ditech.com, there are two fast and easy ways to apply for a second mortgage 24 hours, 7 days a week. You can pick up the telephone and call our toll-free number or apply online at Ditech.com. Right now, you can apply for a second mortgage with Ditech's no closing cost option. Use the money to pay off credit card debt, whatever you want. Ditech.com. There is a difference. Call 1-800-71-FIXED. CNN Tonight, the battle intensifies as the coalition marches toward Baghdad. The latest live from the front lines, plus Colonel David Hackworth, Senator Richard Shelby, and more. Only on Larry King Live, CNN Tonight, 9 Eastern. Baghdad, Iraq, we've been hearing some air raid sirens, but uh, so far it has been little more than that. We're watching it very closely uh, with our night vision scope there, obviously, that hence the green images. Uh, the minute we see anything beyond just the sound of sirens, we will, of course, bring it to you live. In the meantime, let's talk about Apaches with our one of our military experts, retired General Don Shepard, U.S. Air Force. Uh, General Shepard, good to have you with us. First of all, let's uh, bring you up to speed. The U.S. Central Command has confirmed that a U.S. Apache helicopter is missing in Iraq, along with two pilots. We have some pictures from Iraqi TV. It shows the helicopter there uh, on what appears to be probably an auto-rotation landing. We'll ask the general a little bit about that in just a minute. But let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the role of the Apache, its mission, and what happens next now that we know this much. First of all, based on the wreckage, uh, Don Shepard, what are your thoughts on this? Was this uh, perhaps a mechanical went down? It doesn't look like I don't see any evidence of it being shot at. Yeah, you can't uh, look at the uh, you can't look at the video here and see any uh, obvious damage, but it could be that it took a single round through a transmission or something of that sort that ate itself inside. So you can't look at this and tell anything other than obviously the tail or the rotors were not shot off. It perhaps is a mechanical problem. It perhaps is a golden BB that hit it somewhere very vital, but it looks like it was set down under control conditions. The rotors are not bent and that type of thing. So it looks like a control landing, which is good news for the crew. Chances are very high they have survived. Absolutely. This, this at least. We don't know where they are, of course. That's right. the the question of, of uh, the military saying they're considered missing at this point. Let's talk a little bit about what we're talking about when we say Apache. This is the AH-64 Apache Longbow, which is a nice way of saying the latest and greatest version of this. Fires Hellfire anti-tank missiles, has a 30 millimeter Gatling gun on the front. Is it a Gatling gun or just a machine gun? It's a, it's a, it is a Gatling. Think of it as a Gatling gun. Yeah. Let's put it that way. And it's got, uh, it can track 16 targets simultaneously, which boggles the mind. Yeah, on radar, and it's launch and leave on these targets as well. Very, very, uh, very impressive weapon system. That, that kind of dome at the top is part of that whole targeting system. Now, the 11th Attack Helicopter Regiment, which we believe uh, probably is what this Apache belonged to, based in Europe. Uh, lots of Apache helicopters uh, was involved in the Kosovo operation. Uh, let's. Uh, the, the Apache itself, a high-maintenance aircraft, extremely sophisticated, isn't it? It's a extremely sophisticated. It's high maintenance, but they have practiced these tactics. It, it has a high reliability. Uh, it, the idea is to go in with a bunch of helicopters in advance of infantry or armor, scout out, and take care of what's out there, the armor ahead of it. These guys were going in to attack the 2nd Armored Brigade of the Medina Division, one of the Special Republican Guard divisions defending Baghdad. This was tough mission. All right, so find and fix, as the term is. When we say fix, that doesn't... RAF spokesman John Fines uh, spoke to us a little while ago and said that the RAF stands ready to uh, uh, to use uh, air support, uh, call in uh, precision guided munitions. If it comes to that, if they are asked to do that, they are ready. Uh, but obviously, that that is a difficult task in a in a civilian population, as you pointing out. Uh, so much emphasis is being put on avoiding civilian casualties. That's exactly right. Let's roll that um, uh, piece of sound from Colonel Vernal, and he explains what areas they're trying to target. 
We're on the outskirts of Basra. We're seizing fleeting opportunities as he brings his tanks out to the rear outskirts, engaging with direct fire tanks and indeed artillery, but only onto the outskirts where we're pretty clear we're not going to inflict collateral damage on civilians. So you see, Anderson, this is what they're trying to do. It remains to be seen whether they'll be able to limit their operations to their declared intentions. Um, overnight, there was a, an engagement. The British launched a, an operation, a military offensive, into a town just south of Basra. This was designed to... Uh, get some Ba'ath Party officials. We're told that they did capture one. The fate of the other one is unknown, and the strategy there is to uh, get, uh, try to separate the political leadership from the people and to try to win the people away from the political leadership. One British soldier was killed in that operation. And again, showing Iraqi resistance, uh, the Iraqis launched a counteroffensive on the southern Al Fal Peninsula overnight. Um, the British, who are in command of that um, Al Fal Peninsula, called in what they call close air support. That's when on the ground uh, military call in air power and they hit specific targets. And we're told that they hit and destroyed 20 Iraqi armored vehicles, including T-55 tanks. Anderson? Uh, Christian, you talk about uh, the, the, the desire to separate the Ba'ath uh, Party officials from, from the civilian population. Basra, of course, uh, largely Shiite population. Are, are coalition forces still operating under the belief that they will be welcomed by the, the civilians within Basra, that, that, that there is, it is possible to drive a wedge between the, the civilian population and these, these uh, Ferayin, the Ba'ath Party officials? Well, that is their hope, and that's been their hope all along. They hope that the people, perhaps it was a premature hope, would um, sort of spontaneously rise up and welcome the uh, UK and US forces. Now, they believe that one of the reasons that hasn't happened is because of these uh, political militias who are generally used to suppress internal, uh, internal dissent. And these are, as you've mentioned, the Ba'ath Party militias and the Saddam Fedayeen and perhaps others. These are people who are armed with AK-47s, Kalashnikov machine guns, and also with RPGs, uh, rocket-propelled grenades. So they have a certain amount of firepower, um, and they are potentially controlling the internal population as well as harassing uh, British and U.S. forces. Um, so this is something that they're trying to do. Um, and then you've got the added uh, resistance from the Iraqis of the regular army pulling back into the town with much heavier weapon, much, much heavier weapons, including tanks and large elements of infantry. Christian, it'll also be interesting to see uh, if and when uh, the city of Basra is taken, is secured, uh, and, and civilians are able to come out and, and talk to reporters. It'll be interesting to see what impact the fact that there was an uprising there in 1991 after uh, the, Gulf, the first Gulf War uh, that uh, was, was crushed, that, that did not receive uh, international assistance. It'll be interesting to see if that plays, uh, played any role in, in civilians at this point not sort of coming forward. Well, you're exactly right, and there is a certain amount of bitterness or at least long memories about what happened in 1991 when it was perceived that the President of the United States had urged uh, uprisings, and then it was perceived that they were left to their own devices, and if you, as you correctly remember, they were uh, very brutally crushed and repressed. So there is a certain element, uh, we understand, of people waiting to see exactly who has the advantage and who has the upper hand and perhaps being unwilling to um, take on uh, internal militias or, and the like unless they know that, you know, they, they'll win the day. And that apparently, uh, certainly as far as we've seen, is not clear yet. Uh, I, I'm waiting to see where the sandstorm blows, I guess. Uh, Christian, just my final question. I know you've got to cover this thing and, and you've got to go, but I just want to ask one final question. Um, we just heard from Iraq's trade minister, Mohammed Salid, who said basically that Iraq does not need humanitarian help, that they uh, have all the, 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 uh, the money and, and uh, medicine and food they need if only coalition forces will allow it to, to, to get to the people. Uh, they sort of blamed coalition forces and said sort of this whole desire, this whole uh, message from coalition forces of trying to get humanitarian assistance into Basra. Uh, their, Iraq's uh, trade minister basically saying it, it's, it's a lie, more or less. Uh, talk a little bit about the, why, why Basra has become a target. What is the importance to Basra? Is it a military target or is it to get this humanitarian assistance according to coalition forces? Okay, well... Basically, Iraq, the civilians survive on, the, uh, on what's called the oil for food program. 
um, which has been going on for many years now, in which uh, Iraqi oil money is put into escrow and humanitarian supplies, food, medicine, and the like are bought for the people. That has kept the people afloat for the last several years. It stopped now, certainly, of course, since the military operation. Um, so that's one issue. The other issue is that the British and the Americans want to be seen bringing humanitarian aid in, both because it's necessary and, in a way, to win hearts and minds. And so that is their early objective down south was to, uh, to get the port of Umkasa, to start bringing in humanitarian aid, to show the population that these were friendly forces, not occupiers and not uh, repressors, if you like, that they wanted to help the people. So that was a key early objective. And to be frank, they thought they may have been able to accomplish this um, quicker than they have. So far, they have not accomplished it. They have not yet brought in humanitarian aid. So it's a two-pronged effect here. In Basra, they say to us that uh, they, are, they believe they have adequate food supplies for the next several days, and if, if not several weeks. But the humanitarian worry there is over the water, because uh, it's not just water pumping that needs to be done, but also water purification, because this water comes up from the desert and needs to be purified. And right now, the electricity is mostly cut off there. So there is, in some sense, an urgent humanitarian need for the... Um, water, but in other senses, it's got a lot to do with bringing the population on side. All right. It sounds like this thing is heating up in Bonsford, Christian. No doubt we'll be hearing a lot from you in the coming uh, coming hours as we focus on this. Christian Amman for uh, Live, thanks very much. And of course, things have heated up in northern Iraq. We want to bring you to the opposite side of the country right now to check in with reporter Carl Penhall with the Army 5th Corps 11th Attack Helicopter Regiment. Carl, can you tell us uh, what the action looks like now? Yeah, the situation this morning is that the Pentagon has confirmed that two of the pilots involved in the combat mission against Republican Guard unit uh, two nights ago uh, have been captured and are now in Iraqi hands. Uh, those pilots were part of a mission that was flying against the Second Armored Brigade of the Medina Division of the Republican Guard in the early hours of Monday morning. Uh, pilots have been recounting further some of their experiences during that firefight. Uh, the mission itself lasted about three hours and is seen as key to clearing the way to the further advance of infantry units towards Baghdad. The site of the Monday, early Monday's mission was around the town of Karbala, and there the Republican Guard are dug in with T-72 tanks and multiple artillery positions. There was somewhat stiffer resistance than expected, on that mission, particularly from anti-aircraft fire. Most of the helicopters that uh, successfully returned to the airfield where I am at now did receive bullet impact, some of it from small arms fire, some of it from anti-aircraft fire. What the pilots are doing now, though, is assessing the damage and working with maintenance crews to ensure that these helicopters can get back up in the air and back into the fight. Carol. Carl, knowing that two pilots from that company are in the hands of the Iraqi government right now. What's the mood like? That, what is the mood like? A little difficult to speak too much in detail about those kind of things, Carol, but uh, certainly uh, within the battalion, there is a very strong team spirit. Um, when any team members uh, in, in, in Iraqi hands, then obviously that does have an impact here. But like I say, the, the focus of the, the battalion right now is to get the helicopters back up and running, get back in the fight. That says a little bit about the attitude uh, of, of, of this unit, that they, they do want to get back into the fray. Um, obviously, are concerned about the fate of their, um, of their colleagues, so Carol. And from what, what we understand, that Apache helicopter that somehow ended up in southern, um, in 50 miles from Baghdad, I should say, they had to blow it up. Can you tell us more about that? Um, I do. I do understand that um, that the aircraft has now been blown up. Um, that's a routine security precaution to make sure that Iraqi forces don't capture any sensitive uh, material or, or video material, or are able to detect any more about the weapon systems that these helicopters carry on board. They are fairly high-tech machines, $25 million worth, and so the, the intention of the U.S. Army there are that those types of machines do not fall into, into Iraqi hands. 
Carol. And Carl, I want to talk a little bit about the weather because we've heard there are sandstorms right now. Are they happening where you are? Absolutely. There's, there's, there's a, a very strong sandstorm that was blowing up as of last night. Uh, very unpleasant. That said, the, the, the soldiers are equipped with, with goggles and, and protective wear, and so they are continuing about their duties, setting up command posts, um, parts of a convoy that left uh, Northern Kuwait uh, probably four days ago now. The, the main elements of that convoy are now arriving here. The advanced parties have been here for some days, and, and in fact we're here to, to enable the uh, helicopter mission against the Republican Guard to be launched. But the main body of that convoy now arriving, and uh, hence command tents being unpacked, living quarters being unpacked, and, and weaponry also being unpacked. Carol. Yeah, and, and of course you can't fly in a sandstorm, so many in your unit are probably frustrated by the weather at this point. Well, the, these helicopters could in fact fly in, in certain sandstorms. Um, the, the Apaches themselves have got uh, infrared and all sorts of imaging and targeting equipment. And so it's, it's not necessarily a question of that. If push came to shove, there, there would be some decision on that. But quite simply, uh, from what I understand of commanders, we're not at that stage of the fight yet, that, uh, that U.S. forces aren't at that stage of the fight yet, that they don't need to put these helicopters in the air right now. And like I say, uh, concerning the battalion that I'm with, the assessments today are of, of battle damage from uh, previous days. Carol. Thank you. Carl Penhall from northern Kuwait this morning. Well, Carol, we are going to go from uh, Carl's position uh, further north to northern Iraq, where coalition airstrikes have targeted Iraqi frontline positions near Shamshamal. Uh, seeing as Kevin Seitz joins us from there in, uh, in northern Iraq with more. Kevin? Yes, Anderson, we dropped off with our video phone uh, when we were talking to you a little while ago. But as far as I can tell you right now, uh, it seems like if there's a, a ground war in full, uh, full bloom in the south, the air war here is beginning to pick up over the last hour. We've heard a little bit more consistent bombing runs here, uh, some explosions in the far off distance. Uh, to remind our viewers, we're about 40 kilometers away from Kirkuk. We're in Cham Chamal, which is a border town, Kurdish controlled territory. We can't actually see the flashes, but we can hear the sounds of the explosions. They sound uh, to be very powerful at this point. It's kind of like a rolling thunder coming our direction. There's been a lot of talk uh, about a northern front opening up here. At this point, it looks like it's going to be an air war front. Uh, our colleagues Ben Wiedemann and Brent Sadler have been talking about heavy bombing near Mosul last night. We've had some bombing here. It has not been as heavy or as consistent as they are reporting right now. However, on the front lines here in Cham Chamal yesterday, our uh, PUK sources, the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, uh, they're Peshmerga fighters here said they saw eight explosions on the hilltop just over my shoulder. Now, there are a few dozen Iraqi soldiers up there, some anti-aircraft weapons, some heavy machine guns, and the Peshmerga said that they saw these Iraqi soldiers take hits and actually come down the hillside and take cover. They saw them moving their wounded down the hillside out of the range of these, uh, these fighter jets or whatever was dropping bombs on them. Uh, but we came back about 45 minutes later. We had been in Solomonia, and we looked on the ridge line, and they were back up there uh, walking around, fairly nonchalant, like no bombing run had happened. It's going to be strategically important to roll these defenses back as far forward as they are if there's going to be any kind of coalition advance onto Kirkuk from this direction. We're west of Kirkuk, and if there's going to be movement, they're going to have to move past these Iraqi defenses, even though they're, they're fairly lightly defended at this point right in front of us. Uh, there is said to be an Iraqi division behind those hills, the Al Muthana division, which is heavily armed and, uh, and is in between Kirkuk and our position at this point. Also, there's another mili military compound northwest of Kirkuk, the Al Halid military compound. There's also an air base there. It said that, that is a military target as well. So there's a lot of work to be done in an air war uh, before there's any kind of, of ground action here. Um, we've yet to see really any special forces or any type of U.S. ground troops here yet. And uh, I talked to our colleagues Ben Weeman and, and Brent Sadler earlier this morning, and they have not seen very many uh, in their, their portion of the country as well. They're in al Khalak. Uh, however, they did say uh, yesterday, and, and of course there were television reports about 
the Marine General that came there to announce the U.S. presence in northern Iraq for the first time. Anderson? All right, Kevin Seitz, uh, we have uh, some other stuff going on elsewhere in the country, so we're going to cut away from there. I appreciate you joining us. We'll probably check in with you a little bit later on. Sure. Yeah, we're talking about sandstorms, and I mean major sandstorms. In fact, our Alessio Vinci is caught in one. He's with the 2nd Marines 1st Battalion. Uh, Alessio, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Carol. I can tell you we are right in the middle of one of the nastiest sandstorms so far uh, here, which is uh, having the immediate effect, of course, to stop all fighting uh, around the, the city of Nazaria. However, overnight, uh, the battle between U.S. Marines and Iraqi forces continued fiercely, at times reaching high intensity with uh, helicopter gunships, uh, heavy machine guns and mortars all being used at the same time. Uh, the fighting was so intense, as a matter of fact, that uh, a unit of U.S. Marines involved in that fight mistakenly took U.S. forces staged, staged nearby as opposing forces, and we were actually embedded with those forces and began shooting in our direction with 50 millimeters caliber machine guns. One of the Marines uh, in our area was wounded uh, to his shoulder and was immediately evacuated. All this happening in right in the middle of the night while other Marines uh, fran frantically was trying to identify themselves by using chemical lights and special signs. Now, U.S. commanders uh, here in this region are attributing uh, this stiff resistance uh, in Nazaria uh, to paramilitary groups. Uh, they're saying that uh, all but a few of the regular units of the Iraqi army at this point in this area have been defeated or in any case largely uh, downsized. Uh, but they are telling us that uh, uh, this stiff resistance comes mainly by the so-called Saddam's Fedayeen, which is a paramilitary group here uh, in, uh, in Iraq, uh, numbering about 30,000, according to U.S. military intelligence officers uh, here. And they are a great concern to U.S. forces because they're saying that one of the tactics of this uh, Fedayeen's uh, movement is to mingle among civilians. And therefore, U U.S. Marines and the troops here trying to uh, trying to, 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 to seek and destroy those forces are, are at the same time trying to avoid as much as possible civilian casualties. But if these militants mingle among civilians, the U.S. Marines say they have no choice but to shoot in that direction, even though they're trying to min minimize as much as possible uh, civilian casualties. We're also reporting uh, that uh, we also received reports that the, U uh, the uh, U.S. forces have taken a number of prisoners of war, uh, including some senior Iraqi officers. And just in the last few seconds, Carol, just to make matters even worse, it is now raining. Oh, Back you're kidding. You. So a sandstorm with rain? That seems odd. Um, unless I've, you'll... I've never seen... Go ahead. I've never seen something like that, I'm telling you. Is that why we're getting you on the phone and not by video phone because of the weather? That, that is correct. It, it would be virtually impossible to, 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 uh, to use the video phone with this kind of weather because the, the panel of the antennas that we need to open up in order to use that technology would, would basically fly away. You would need, you know, the, the Marines there next to the antennas to hold them still. I just can't imagine they have how it other is. jobs to do around here. I can't <laughs> imagine how it is to fight in such conditions. And, of course, the objective from... From your standpoint, is they want to get control of those two bridges over the Euphrates River, and I'm not sure if coalition forces have control of that of those bridges. Can you tell us, uh, Carol? I, I do have the answer to that to, uh, that question, but uh, you know it is an ongoing military operation, and we have been asked. And one of the rules uh, for us journalists embedded with the U.S. military is that we could not discuss the details okay. of uh, ongoing military operations. So Say I cannot no more. I answer totally understand. All I, can tell you is, all I can tell you is that we have, we're beginning to see some traffic coming through. Okay. Another question for you as it um, applies to the friendly fire you were speaking of. Of course, the weather is a factor. And what kind of measures are they taking to prevent that? Or can they take any measures? You know, there are a lot of forces in this area, and we are scattered, and the, they are scattered, and we, the reporters with them, scattered uh, throughout uh, uh, pockets, if you want, especially near uh, areas where uh, the, uh, it is believed to be uh, the high number of Iraqi soldiers and Iraqi paramilitary groups as well. So uh, the measures that you can take, of course, is by, make, by, by, by having some signals, by having some special light. The problem, of course, and I, I noticed that last night when we were under... Uh, under fire by, by, by friendly and coalition forces was the fact that up until that moment we were asked not to use any kind of lights. I mean, we couldn't even use the red lights. We cannot use our computers. We cannot do, we cannot, I couldn't even use my phone because obviously the display of the phone makes a little bit of gleam of light. So we were really told to be in total darkness so that not, not to give uh, the position of where the Marines and us with them are now. The moment we started receiving uh, incoming fire by U.S. forces, then of course 
we start, uh, the U.S. Marines start using their chemical lights and all kinds of signals that obviously not only signal to the, to the other uh, uh, U.S. forces where we were, but also gave the position to, 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 to Iraqi position. Uh, and, and so far, of course, uh, uh, that, is, that, and that is a problem. So it is, if you want, a, a problem, because if you, if you can tell other forces uh, where you are, then, of course, those who are, you're trying to fight also will find out where you are. I certainly understand that. Alessio Vinci, we're going to let you go, because I know you're just undergoing some horrible conditions right now. Mm. Sandstorm and it's raining. And to come under friendly fire in a situation like that. and Just I mean, because it, you can't see. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to a short break, and we'll be right back. It's 4.30 or so a.m. Introducing New America Online 8.0. With hundreds of new features, there's never been a better time to try it. You've got mail. With 8.0, I can customize my email. AOL's new parental controls I can set up for each one of my children. Now AOL searches are faster than ever with Google. The customer service is free and it's 24 hours a day. Call now and get 1,025 free hours for 45 days. There's no commitment and you don't even need a credit card. America Online has so much more. New AOL 8.0. With hundreds of new features, there's never been a better time to try it. CNN puts you alongside the troops with soldiers. Walter Rogers, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, Brian Chilcote with sailors. Frank Buckley, Kira Phillips, Gary Stryker with airmen. Gary Tuckman, Bob Franken with Marines. Jason Bellini, Art Harris, Martin Savage. Plus, CNN joins forces with top news organizations and our network of affiliates to put more reporters in the region than anyone. No one gets you closer than CNN, the most trusted name in news. It is 4.33 a.m. here on the East Coast. Let's take a look at what's happening at this hour. There are a lot of developments happening all over. Intense fighting has broken out again in Nasiriyah as U.S. Marines drove through the southern Iraqi city. The Marines had to abandon two vehicles that got stuck in the mud. Five other vehicles were destroyed. Intense fighting there. British military officials have changed their strategy. They now say the city of Basra is a legitimate military target. The Allies had previously wanted to avoid fighting in the city, but Iraqi fighters have pulled back into Basra as part of a plan to try to engage coalition troops on Iraq's own terms. Kuwaiti volunteers began loading the trucks with food for the Iraqi people. We're going to have more on this shortly. The trucks will carry some 45,000 meals daily to Iraqis. It is not immediately known how or when the aid will get into Iraq. Iraq's trade minister said a short time ago that Iraq doesn't need any humanitarian assistance. More on the story, as we said, from Darren Kagan, live in Kuwait City in just a minute. Continuing our look across the uh, country of Iraq, U.S. intelligence reports suggest the Iraqi Republican Guard may, and we have to stress, may have ordered the use of chemical weapons against U.S. forces. That is, if they cross a so-called red line, a red line drawn around Baghdad. But one U.S. official says that doesn't mean they will do it. U.S. Air Force officials say the skies over Iraq have been virtually devoid of Iraqi aircraft, you're looking at a graphic just uh, overall of the Iraqi Air Force. They say the Iraqi Air Force hasn't flown a single sortie since the war began. Now, Iraq has more than 300 fighter planes in its arsenal. President Bush released the first estimate of the cost of war with Iraq. The president is asking Congress for $75 billion. Now, that is based on an estimate that the conflict will last about 30 days, and he's apparently going to make an announcement, according to uh, Dana Bash, uh, later on today at the Pentagon. We'll, we'll carry that as well. And those are the stories making news at this hour. We continue now with our regular coverage of the war on Iraq. Actually, here's what's coming up in that next hour of our coverage in the war on Iraq. We'll take a look at the cost of the war. President Bush has given his first estimate. We'll have a reaction to that. Also, we'll look at the efforts to get food to Iraqi civilians caught in the middle of war. Plus, we'll talk about a U.S. intelligence report on a possible plan, and we stress possible plan by the Iraqi Republican Guard to use chemical weapons. Our coverage of the war in Iraq continues right now. Why don't we take that live picture of Baghdad right now? Let's do that, shall we? That's right, because, you know, we've been on the air a long time, and we're going to have these technical problems because, frankly, the people here have, working, have been working around the clock. Okay, it's 12.35 p.m. in Baghdad, and you're looking at a rather peaceful picture of Baghdad. Of course, 
We don't know if the rest of Baghdad looks this way. We do know that there have been a number of bombs dropped on the city throughout the night. When was the last time? Do you remember, Anderson? Uh, we, the last report we had was several hours ago. There was a Reuters report, uh, according to one witness, that there had been an explosion. But uh, according to our own reporters uh, um, uh, aboard several U.S. Uh, ships, uh, Saddam International Airport it has been a target in the in the last 12 hours or so. I, I think I'm right in saying the last 12 hours or so. Um, Definitely so. One of the targets that now uh, apparently being hit in Baghdad. Okay, and we've been talking a lot about humanitarian aid for the past couple of hours. Of course, the coalition forces trying to take control of Basra right now to get that humanitarian aid into that port city. But there is another effort underway in Kuwait City, and that's where Darren Kagan is right now. No shortage of volunteers wanting to get help to the Iraqi people. There, Darren. Uh, good afternoon to you, Carolyn Anderson. Uh, yeah, kind of an incredible picture we've been witnessing here in Kuwait City. This is the Kuwait Red Crescent. The folks behind me are all volunteers. They are boxing up individual meals that don't need cooking, and they're also boxing up uh, supplies that would last an individual family supposedly a week. These trucks will leave today. These are the first trucks they're going to leave um, from Kuwait, make their way up to the border. No word yet, though, on when they'll actually be able to cross the border and make it into Iraq. Why the big concern? Well, we're getting reports out of Iraq just how desperate it is in certain cities. These supplies will be going to Safwan just across the border, but we want to head a little bit east of there and show you pictures that we've been getting in from Basra, the second largest city in all of Iraq. A very difficult situation there. Big concerns about the water and the electricity situation and the water system in Iraq is based on an electrical system so if the power goes out there goes the clean water. Basra has 1.7 million people. There is fears that there are 100,000 children under the age of five who are at risk of disease, a severe disease threat especially with dirty water. Now they do have access to the Euphrates River but the problem is they also dump sewage into that river and so it becomes very dirty if it cannot be cleaned. All this getting the attention all the way up to the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, and this is what he had to say about the situation. I don't have all the facts, but I'm, I've heard a report from.